Hi, and welcome to episode 77 of the SBP podcast, The Voice of Mobile Film. I'm your host, Susie Botello. Our guest for this episode of the SBP podcast is in Utah, but this month he planned a trip to San Diego with several crew members to screen his feature film, Married and Loving It. He shot the entire film with an iPhone, and he was really looking forward to being a part of the International Mobile Film Festival in San Diego in person. Now, you can watch his film for a very limited time during the Virtual Film Festival online on April 25th and 26th. Now, you can follow us on social media to get all the details, or you can click on the link on the show notes. Um, Also, You can do a basic Google search for the hashtag, which is all in one word, MFF 2020 San Diego. And that should also provide links to our social media. Ryan is going to share a bit about the movie, some creative tips on lighting, location, and strategy. And then his producer, Brandy Rich, jumps into the conversation and brings her own perspective to the discussion. So... How does one go from wanting to work as a spy to film director and actor anyway? Let's find out. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the SBP podcast, the voice of mobile film. I am here, sort of, uh, not, but I uh, got a guest here, which is a very special guest. He's part of the International Mobile Film Festival, uh, shot a feature film on an iPhone. Uh, the film is called Married and Loving It. And if you're married and loving it, clap your hands. Hi, Ryan. <laughs> Hi, how's it going? <laughs> it's going Thanks good. Um, I'm trying not to be a comedian because I really am not a good comedian. <laughs> but it just came to my mind. Um, clap your hands, Ryan. I'm not married yet, so. (laughs) Oh, well, you're almost there. Um, Actually, Ryan has a really cool story to share with us uh, regarding the film and um, and some super good news, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, So as as you know, we've spoken before is that uh, one of the producers on the film, Brandy Rich, um, who will also be joining us here for the interview, is uh, her and I we started out a long time as just friends. And then, um, as the years kind of went by, we, we decided we were more than friends and then, um, we're engaged now and to be married. And, um, we've had to postpone that just a little bit on the date because of everything that's going on right now in the world. But, um, it's pretty fun to be, uh, you know, not only a, to have a club, a collaborator as talented as, as her, to work with, but then also at the same time, um, share your time with and share your life with. So, and you guys were going to get married at the film festival on our red carpet, right? Was that the yeah, plan? <laughs> that was, that was the plan. <laughs> um, well, I have a, a few questions for you. Um, before we go anywhere from here really quick, um, wanted to share with our listeners a little bit about your film. So if you can, just share a little bit about the synopsis about of the film. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Married and Loving It is kind of a day in the life of a, uh, a marriage that's on its 10-year anniversary, just on the eve of the 10-year anniversary. And in that day in the life, what we portray is um, the ins and outs of a highly toxic relationship um, and the highs and lows that you can experience just in the simple day of, of being married or in that type of relationship. So being where one, at one point you're absolutely in love with the person. And on the other hand, you're also, um, you know, at each other's throat with a knife or a gun, just that kind of, that kind of back and forth. Yeah. You know, very typical knife or a gun, right? 
very typical thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, uh, your film is actually kind of a drama, but uh, a little bit of um, terror and comedy. Mm -hmm. It's basically, it has everything. I mean, it has some, some romance to it as well. Um, but it's a, it's a good story and it, and it comes and we're not going to talk about that because, you know, we don't want to blow it for anybody, but it is, um, it does have a really, it has a twist at the end that sort of brings everything mm -hmm. together and makes, not that it doesn't make sense, you know what I mean? But it just sort of mm -hmm. rounds it, you know, gives it a good round. Who wrote yeah. that? You wrote that, right? Or. Correct. Yeah. I wrote, um. Yeah, I wrote it, wrote it, directed it, and then I also am acting in it as well. So, Ryan, you are a mobile filmmaker passionista, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, when uh, we spoke before, um, or want to let our listeners know, uh, this is not Ryan's first film. Uh, he's made several films before this and will continue to make many more films, I'm sure. Um, but share a little bit about where, you know, where you come from with our listeners. Uh, what got you started in the filmmaking? What bit you? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up in Ogden, Utah, which is just north of Salt Lake City um, here in Utah. And, and kind of a, the thing with film is it kind of came to me very early on. I was very fortunate to be one of those people who just realized at a younger age, just what I wanted to do, um, with my life and my passion, um, and that being in film. And so it kind of struck me. I, I was in the, I was in about the ninth grade and I had different ideas of things that I thought maybe I wanted to be as far as like a, a police officer or a lawyer or, um, even a spy at one point was on my mind. And I kind of came to realize that it was because of movies that I was watching. I wanted to be a cop because I liked Dick Tracy so much with the movie of Warren Beatty. And then and then the reason why I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer is because of regarding Henry and, and Harrison Ford. And I didn't want to be that type of um, guy uh, that he is in the movie at the very beginning of the movie. Um, and then also to even a spy it was just my obsession with James Bond, which Goldeneye had, had come out. And um, and at the time when Goldeneye came out, I was around 12 years old. So for me, uh, it just kind of hit me at the right at the right time. And so um, I realized that actually the reason why I love all of these things and, and the stories that I tell is because I think ultimately I just want to be a filmmaker and make movies. And so from there, then just my focus through high school, my focus, uh, then I just knew I wanted to go to college. I want to get a, I wanted to get a film degree and I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And apparently I think not also because the first thing that comes to mind regarding all these things that you wanted to do was that you were into the whole um, crime scene uh, genre, but it seems like it's more like the the thrilling suspense of it all, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I just think overall I've also come to more understanding of you know, even who I am in my own group of friends and whatnot. Like I'm, you know, every tribe has a storyteller and. I just, I'm that person. I, I enjoy telling stories and kind of um, elongating them or adding lots of context into them so that the stories make more sense or even making them kind of punchy and whatnot. And so um, it's it's kind of just a, a mantra that I have is not really something that I think about doing. It's just something that I like to do and I have to do. Um, what was it about, what is it about storytelling that... Um that really, uh, gets you, I'm, I'm sort of that way too. Uh, storytelling has been a very meaningful thing in my life, uh, in many experiences, but what, what is it about it that, that really attracts you to it? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think, I think that it's, it, you know, storytelling is a way of kind of reliving a memory at times as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that we as people, we often it feels like we like to be nostalgic about things as well. Um, and so and re kind of reliving that that memory. And then um, I don't know, I just I think that I, I just enjoy telling those telling those stories. And oftentimes, you know, if you're writing um, 
you know, even if you're writing something that's like a sci-fi film or maybe even a horror film, it's, it can derive from like a dream that you had or, or something. So you're still recalling like a memory or thought that you had in some, de- in some degree. Yeah, yeah. That's very, uh. that's very cool. Um, all right. Now you were talking about your friends earlier and, um, I have a feeling some of the people in this, uh, film are friends, right? Yeah, a lot of them. Well, a lot of the actors I I met um, just as we were just through the casting call of trying to get the movie made. One one of the actors, um, however, Mike Solaris, and he's in the first segment of the movie. Um, him and I have worked together before on other projects, so I've known him for quite some time. So with Mike, it was more or less I, I knew that I wanted to put together a project for him that would involve him as well. So, I mean, when it came to the casting, it was kind of his part to lose to a degree um, when it comes to the actors in the film. Now, as far as the crew, though, it's it's been one of those um, things where, you know, it started out my other producer on the film is Jason White and him and I have known each other since high school. So together we have kind of grown with both of these, both of us wanting to be, you know, storytellers, filmmakers uh, along the way as well. And um and so, and then we've kind of collectively had just built a film group of people here in Ogden, but we've been working together long enough now for nine to nine to 10 years that they are now just our friends. And so, um, we've, you know, we've been lucky in that sense as well, that when I'm making the movie with my friends, it's not just, you know, the, the people who are my friends, but they're only really doing me a favor by making the movie. These are people who are also passionate about the storytelling that we're going to you know, that we're going to do and they're, they're passionate about, you know, um, camera and sound and being just filmmakers along with us. So, yeah, it's a, so at this point is they're my friends and my, and my family. Yeah. You, um, you know, exactly about the family. Um, that's what I noticed too. Uh, I've worked in films before and, um, one of my favorite parts of it was like, now that we all know we get along together and we work so well together, um, let's keep making movies so we have a good excuse to get together, you know, uh, take yeah. a few weeks off of whatever else we're doing to, yeah. um, you know, kind of um, go through that. But you, it, it takes special people uh, to do this. It's not it's not a regular project, you know what I mean? It, yeah. it sort of consumes you um, and everyone else involved. And, in, I mean, I've worked with people that have, you know, broken bones and continued to work without even showing that, you know, that they Mm -hmm. broke something. (laughs) Um, Now you also acted in the, in the film. You're one of the protagonists of the film. Yeah. And um, that's also been just something that I was really interested in. And when I was younger as well um, was being an actor. And so a lot of my first, when I was like my short films in high school, um, would, I was playing the character, I was playing the protagonist and also directing at the same time. But I found that, uh, I just wasn't getting some of the shots that I wanted, or again, this is now way back in high school. So I'm, I'm using friends who are just really helping me out by doing me a favor to a degree. And so I started taking more of a step back and just being a director for a long time. Um, and only being focused on, uh, you know, you know, the, the behind the camera aspects of things. And then as the years go by, um, and now working with, uh, cinematographer and director, Matt Johnson, um, and then Jason White, who's a producer on my film, but also a writer and director in his own right. And while we were working on our movies and we needed an actor, I would start jumping in. And so then kind of the last few years, I've been kind of doing a lot more of the acting and less of the directing hmm. aspect of things. And so, you know, I, you don't know in a sense how many, how many times you're ever going to have a chance to, to be in a feature film. And there I was w- directing a feature film and I, and I needed actors for it. And I started thinking, you know, I don't want to pass up a chance to play a, a lead character in a feature film. So I kind of said then selfishly took one of the, cause I only had four open spots and Mike was taking one and so I kind of selfishly took another one. <laughs> Just to, uh, so that I could, so I could have that as well, just in case, you know, um, the deathbed comes, um, early or maybe I never make another movie again, or I never get that other acting chance. I want to be able to spot where I could have easily hired myself. Yeah. And so that's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, why not? 
and yeah. and and it's something that I share a lot with actors, you know, or or even um, screenwriters, you know, who um, approach me, you know, asking about, you know, if I could if I could help them get um, get their screenplay made into a movie, basically. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, what about you? And they're yeah. look, they're like, what? You know, and I tell them the same thing. It's like, just grab your phone, you know, and start. Mm-hmm. Don't you don't need to start with that, um, with that one. But eventually, you'll get to it. Um, and it's the same thing with actors who are not getting parts. You know, just cast yourself in uh, in your own film. And um, speaking of that, um, it it just reminds me these other films that you worked on. Um, you know, these other mobile films. Um, uh, what were they about? Were they any similar? And I know they were shorts, but mm-hmm. uh, share a little more about how you basically gain the the learning curve, basically, from mobile shorts to feature films. Yeah. Um, and so what we were doing before, the other sh- short films that I was involved with, um, especially focusing around shooting with the with the phone was... Uh, I did a, a series that we call the replacement trilogy and it's a series of three short films. One of which is like three minutes long. The other one's like seven minutes long. And the third installment is half hour, uh, in length. So when you put them together, it's about 40 minutes. Um, I also act in those. I'm not directing. Um, but, uh, but I, one of my stipulations is cause I wrote the premise of it and for the, for the director, um, her name is Madison, and my only stipulation was is I wanted to shoot them on a mobile phone. Um, we originally shot one of them. We actually remade it. Uh, we shot it originally with a Samsung Galaxy 3. And I think at the time, you know, there was a lot of – this is um, this is probably about six six or seven years ago, and, and a lot of people who are making movies at our level – you know, people keep talking about the red camera, the red camera, and people are even spending, you know, thousands of dollars, um, hundred dollars a day to rent the camera, thousand dollars for the entire shoot. And they're doing all these things they can to get the, to get the red, but plus they're not the really, insurance. Yeah, plus the insurance, and so they're not really focusing on um, sometimes even like even the actual storytelling or the narrative itself, or you know, they're so focused on what's the quality of your camera, and um, so. I was just thinking, well, you know, we have these phones and it's kind of this emerging technology as far as the video aspect of it and how well they can shoot. And why don't we just use those and see what kind of boundaries we can push. So we started making those. Um, so we did the first one on the Samsung and it came out okay. Um, but then when we started making the other series, we started shooting with the iPhone 6S, which is the same phone that we later would shoot uh, Married and Loving It on. And then um, another short film series that we have is – um, we always, every year in Salt Lake, there's what's called the Demon Chaser Film Festival. Mm-hmm. And, um, we always submit and the short film that, that we put out is always, we call it ancient evil and we just give it some obscure title after that. Um, we've never actually made an ancient evil one, two or three, but we title them like number seven, like ancient evil six, the last reckoning or something like that. We're kind of goofy with it in that yeah. sense. But we, um, Matt Johnson, who is the cinematographer on married and loving it, he's, um, a horror director. And so when he's directing those movies, just from his experience using the iPhone on the replacement series, he just started going, well, I like this. I like it better. It's, it's lighter. It's easier to move around. We can get good, good video quality. Um, let's just do that. And in my mind, I was always secretly going, if I make a feature film, I want to see if we can do it on an iPhone. And then we came up to this and I said, well, this is it. Let's make the movie with the iPhone. Yeah, I think the cinematography aspect of the phone is always attractive um, in that sense because you can get angles and position the camera, right, the phone, in places mm-hmm. where you can't and get these really cool perspectives that way that are very yeah. unique. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, of course, we're not, you know, we're shooting a movie on a very micro, micro low budget um you know, level. And so we don't have, we're not on, we're not on a sound stage. We don't have the ability to take apart the walls or, you know, um, dig up the floor in order to get that citizen cane low angle shot. So having a camera that is, you know, as thin as, is easy to put in your pocket, um, to be able to put that camera, you know, anywhere you need and kind of, uh, work with it like that is, has that, has that 
type of freedom to it that a larger camera wouldn't give us. Yeah, and the experiment, you know, you were talking about Citizen Kane, and I was thinking about all these um, all these movies. Um, was it Rosebud or one of those where they dug into the stage? Mm-hmm. And um, that took a lot of work just to put the camera in there where, I mean, if you wanted to dig a little hole to put an iPhone in, that would just take, what, a minute? <laughs> yeah, just a small scoop. Right? Uh, yeah, it's really, really, really... Um, a really versatile, probably the most versatile camera uh, that you can use out there. And and also it probably helped you because you shot this mostly in uh, either one house in different rooms or several houses, I'm not sure. But I know it was supposed to have been shot in different houses and different um, rooms in different houses. And um, you were using uh, traditional lighting, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the actual, when I first came up with it, um, my intention was to make it a film of, with just the two people, the husband and wife, and there was always going to be the same two actors Mm -hmm. the whole time. And then, um, kind of, you know, I was looking at more also making a film because we'd done all these short films and I was like, well, I'll just do five scenes. I won't do anything crazy or long. We can just tackle each of those five scenes the same way we tackle a short film. We'll go from there. And then, uh, so it was always going to be in the same house, but it was originally going to be the same two actors the entire time. And then when we were speaking about, um, well, what happens if I hire somebody and they, they shoot part of the movie and then three months later we finally get the money to do the rest of the movie and now they've cut their hair or how do I combat that or what if something happened to them? And then producer, my producer Jason White, he said, well, because he knows I'm, I love this. There's a movie called uh, The Obscure Object of, of Desire by Louis Spoonwell. Where, where the main actress or the main uh, female character in the movie is played by two different actresses, and it and it switches at various times. So Jason said, "Why don't you just do that?" And then each piece can be its own. And I just love the idea. I was like, "I'll keep it in the same house, and it can be interpreted however we want to. If it's the same couple, is it multiple couples? Do we all just have the same problems? Um, ultimately, and and uh, just kind of left it in that, but." It, it always in my mind was going to be the same house. Um, it, was, it just was later that changing actors was was added into the mix. Yeah, well, I mean, you can basically uh, do whatever you want, but you do it on purpose, you know, for mm. for a, for an effect. But that effect is part of the story, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, when you when you were um, what I was also getting to was um because you were using traditional lighting and stuff like that and you know there's some gear to be moved around for the most Mm -hmm. part you know even if you're just moving from room to room uh because of the you know there's an application to lighting you know where Mm -hmm. where do the lights go and where are we going to shoot and uh things get in the way of of light and different times of the day affect the lighting and all these little things. But just the fact that even though you had to work with that, just the fact that the camera was pick up and go, it probably saved you a lot of time, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, oh, at times we were shooting, you know, 18 pages a day. Um, and wow. <laughs> just to, just to try to, I think the stuff that really took us the longest part was the final scene where everything starts to really come clashing together. Um, but just for each individual segment, there were one day shoots that we were putting together. Um, well, minus the scene that I'm in, cause there's a lot going on in that scene, um, with a lot of the different cuts and obviously some of the more graphic pieces, um, <laughs> the shocking but, uh, pieces. Yeah. Yeah. Pieces. <laughs> so that one did, Is yeah. that a hint? <laughs> pieces. There we go. Um, so that was, so that was a three day shoot, but for the other ones, um, you know, we, we were able to knock those out in one day, uh, which would be like segment one, two, and then. Four, I think. Um, but yeah, and then the, the lighting, a lot of the times, because we are shooting during the day, um, a lot the lighting, and we shot this also in the summer. Um, so it's Oof. it's all natural light coming in. The way that the house that we picked, the way that the, the house happened to face, just made it really easy to get sunlight to come in um, through the windows. And then at other times, you know, we're just using bounces or reflectors to, uh, to achieve what we want. Or... Um, we have just lights, you know, just whatever, whatever lamp was in the corner. Um, on some of the other stuff, we, 
we, in order to, to shoot it, we would, cause with, that's the thing with the iPhone. If you use a traditional light, it's way too hot. It's way too bright and you can't tone it down. Um, so there's some of the, some of the scenes that are shot in the dark where we're, we're actually using other people's cell phones hmm. with the flashlight on cool. to achieve the effect. And then even for what seems like the most simple sh- thing in the world, which is one of the shots at the end of the movie where you can see, um, you know, the couple's friends have just pulled up in their car and they're walking towards the front door. Yeah. Something as simple as that. We're actually moving our cars outside around and putting our headlights on so we can light the, that, that background up. Yeah. So, um, so that's, that's also how low budget we were. Yeah. On this. Well, no, but, but that's not actually, it's, uh, it's actually being creative. Um, I was in a, I worked on a film where, uh, we were, I think we were like four stories up and they used the light downstairs outside to shine it in through the window as the actor was looking out the window and saying his lines and the way it lit him up and that, uh, silhouette type of an effect. It was really cool. It was really awesome. But the guy who thought about doing that creatively actually had worked on in the lighting group at um, the Titanic film. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's just about getting – it's about being creative and, um, you know, regardless of the of the budget, you know, it's, it's about getting that shot and making it – making it happen in the most creative and um, – I mean, it's, it, it, it's work you know, to even come up and, and mm-hmm. try something and then to find out it doesn't work. But when it works, that's, you capture it forever. It's movie magic, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So tell us a little more about your crew and the actual, um, uh, the way, the way that the film came together, uh, for you guys, did you guys have any, headaches throughout the film that you had to reshoot or redo or rethink? Um, I'm trying to think. I know nothing too major at the, at the moment. No, I mean, nothing besides just the basics of trying to shoot, you know, um, 18 pages in a day. But yeah, we were lucky. Yeah. You know, we didn't run into anything as far as like power failure or, um, or anything. Um, how many people were in your crew? So, uh, on any given day, so there's other times where we have people who could help on certain days, but then weren't able to help on others. But for the most part, we had about eight people, I'd Mm -hmm. say on the crew. So somewhere between five to yeah, six to eight people, uh, usually as far as the crew goes. Um, yeah, no real, Major hiccups, Megan. How about you give them all each a shout out with um, the part that they played, meaning, you know, in the crew? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, like I mentioned before, um, Jason White is a uh, producer on the film and also the first AD for the movie as well. Uh, Matt Johnson, again, also a writer, director, um, but for my film, a cinematographer for the movie. Uh, Brandy Rich. Uh, producer, second assistant director, line producer, production manager. Oh wow! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she wore uh, she wore many different uh, you know key 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 person on the film. Wow! Hi, Susie. Uh, this is Brandy. Oh, hi. I've arrived on the call. How are you doing? <laughs> Thanks for having me. Hi, Brandy. Everybody, hi this you? is the uh, the producer, the the one that carried the film through, right? <laughs> Yeah, I wore like Ryan said, I wore many different hats. Yeah, on many different days. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. How how um how did you how did you two meet? Um, we met. We used to work together. Um, about seven years ago, we met. Um, at a company that we both used to work for. Um, and I was actually looking for a Ogden Film Group to connect with, and I happened to meet Ryan and then our friend Jason, who's also a producer on the film. And they got talking about their film group and I was expressed interest in, in screenwriting and that I really want to get involved. And they kind of invited me into that local group. So that's how we met and we've known each other ever since. 
And you you were also an actor in the movie, right? No, no, I, nope. nope. I, I, I prefer not even walk in or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I prefer just more of the the behind the scenes. That's kind of where my my love is. Yeah, it's behind the camera. Mm-hmm. Did you guys have a script supervisor or anyone doing continuity? Yes, we did. Um, Danielle Bandinelli. Yeah, she was great and very helpful. Um, she wore a couple different hats. Sometimes we had Danielle run Slate, or she was scripty that day. Um, so we had, we had folks kind of in and out on different days, depending on availability and who was around. Um, but like Ryan said, mainly scheduling went pretty well. Overall production went well. Um, some of the only other disturbances outside of filming I could think of was just outside noise. (laughs) (laughs) Um, that was a, I think that was a big one. Like we've had to, I remember one day we had to. Um, ask someone nicely to stop mowing their lawn. So why? Why did they? <laughs> why do? Why is that? Like it's always that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess when you film in the summer, it's <laughs> you have to expect it, right? I don't know. I, I, I. Every every film I've ever worked on, I, I remember. The, I used to live up in the mountains, and um, <laughs> you know, you do the duty where you tell all the neighbors you're going to be shooting and when and all this stuff. That was the day the guy decided to use the electric saw to uh, cut the branches off of trees or something, dead branches, um, next door. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Yeah. And, yeah, I'm mowing the lawn and, you know, weed whacking, whatever you call those things. And there's always – sometimes you can work them in, you know. Uh, but yeah, that is that is kind of a pen. It uh, sounds like you know your neighbor obliged. They yeah, they were uh, a friend of ours uh, who was a location manager, Justin Witten. Um, it was his house that he was kind enough to let us shoot in. Um, so, but yeah, just we had to send a couple people out a couple times just to stop a lawn from you know being mowed or. Um, you know, we'd have to offer them a drink later, like, we're so sorry, you know. <laughs> so anything barking we could dogs. do, a barking dog. So yeah. it was really out of our control, but um, mainly just outside disturbances, I yeah. think, were the biggest hiccup. Mm-hmm. And you did do, you did record all your sound externally? Um, we did some external sounds. Yeah, um, all, of the, all of the sound is recorded uh, externally um, using, um, we use the a Tascam and a Zoom yeah. as well. Um yeah, we, we didn't want to cut any corners on sound. Um, Johnny Griego was our sound supervisor. Great he was guy. great. Yeah. Um, and, and he he's very knowledgeable in that area, and he knew exactly what to do. And um, that, I think that really helped sound. Sound was very important to us, so mm-hmm. we didn't we didn't want to make sure that we cut any corners there. Yeah, it is very. It's important for all films to have you know good sound, and you know a lot of people forget that most films um, don't record their sound directly into the video into the camera yeah yeah they say we'll worry about it in post and you know we didn't want to do that <laughs> <laughs> no so, you don't want to ex- as much as possible right mm-hmm. um so let me ask you guys i know um and i want to share this with our listeners that um you know the film festival this year uh the corona covid19 virus um you know we we you guys were going to come out to San Diego and screen your film, mm-hmm. uh, but we've had to we're we're going into a virtual film festival this year, uh, and we're doing some creative things. So people are going to watch your film online uh, for a couple of days. But um, you you guys have has this film screened in any other film festival before? Will you guys share this part with our listeners? Uh, so it has not uh, at this point. Um, so initially in San Diego was going to be the the premiere for um, for the film, and and at this point also a lot of the the cast and the crew have not seen the movie. We had had plans to um, you know sometime in the end of May, maybe June, to hold like a private screening here at one of the theaters that we have locally. Um, but obviously with everything going on. Um, not sure if, when the next time we're going to be able to get a public space like that. So, uh, so we haven't. So, yeah, the International Mobile Film Festival is going to be uh, the place to see it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, we are going to do everything possible to 
<laughs> to to do the best with the film. It, it you know I always I always um, uh, this year. Um, I mean, this is our ninth edition of the film festival. Um, and I made a big deal. I had this conversation with you, Ryan, about having the film festival uh, show respect, right, to the right. filmmakers because they shot their films on. And, and back in 2009, if you shot a film, uh, it wasn't on the big screen, right? Um, right. It, it just didn't receive because of YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't receive any real accolades. Um, it was like, oh, yeah, you just shot a video for YouTube type thing. Um, mm. And that was, you know, that was when Netflix was finally uh, getting bigger, more, you know, people were recognizing online streaming, but no one was there yet. And so my thing was, well, if I don't have an online film festival. I have a live venue to put these movies shot with these little phones on the big screen and invite the filmmakers to come out, roll out the red carpet for them. People have to respect this. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Yeah. And this year I'm just like, darn, you know, but it, it's the ninth edition. It's not like, oh, I haven't proven anything. Um, and other film festivals, but you know, now there are places like Sundance and Cannes that are showing some of these films shot with with mobile phones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, on sixty foot screens and you know and all that. But I'm gonna miss the fact that I don't get to meet you guys in person and and share you with everybody in the same room. And you just mentioned that you know the the film is 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 it going to be screened for the first time or, you know, in this film festival, man, it just would have been so cool to have you guys, uh, sit in the audience and seeing everybody's reaction, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, it's, it's sorry, Brandy. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly disheartening for us as well. Um, and we were really excited about, um, coming out there and, and Mike Solaris, who I spoke about earlier, he had even planned on, on coming as well. And so, wow. um, you know, I think, Obviously, this is a very unique experience for for all of us, and the, you know the thing we can just do is look forward. You know, you and I spoke before about maybe uh, coming out next year, yeah. um, and how can we continue to collaborate? So, I mean, we'll, we'll get there. Um, unfortunately, it didn't happen this year, but but uh, just to add to to what Ryan said, um, no, we appreciate you still looking for other opportunities or other venues to to stream these filmmakers films that they've worked so hard on. And instead of just canceling the entire event, you've looked for another opportunity to stream our, our film and connect with us. And I think that's, what's important. And it's, I haven't heard of too many festivals doing that. So I think what you're, what you're doing is, is great. And we appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. Um, to me, it's, uh, it's kind of, a it's, it's this whole mobile filmmaking community, which is one of the reasons why I invited you to, to be in the podcast is, so that people can, uh, especially because of the the passion that you guys have for mobile filmmaking, um, to inspire our listeners that um, you know you can you can take a phone out of your pocket. Yeah, you can shoot little videos and things like that. But you guys went all the way. You shot a feature film. Uh, you wrote how many pages was your was it like a hundred pages? Uh, I think it was more than that. I think it, it came like out to. Not for very long yet. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's been a minute since I've looked at the script. We have, we have a few different scripts. So. <laughs> We're always right. Yeah. Well, they uh, always say a script is never done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, we have a few different other um, feature scripts that we have. And so, but for Married and Loving It, it was at uh, 88 pages. 88 pages, right. Uh, it's um the the film itself is it's literally like ninety minutes long almost to the T. It's like yeah. eighty nine, eighty eight minutes or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's very close. Yeah, and uh, and that was our our cutoff too was like ninety minutes. Oh yeah, you know. <laughs> so just you guys did it. good. Yeah. yeah, you just did. <laughs> but you know, and sometimes I do. I I have to tell. They're like, oh, it's like you know, it's like ninety one minutes, and I'm like. Oh my God, you can totally just cut a minute, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Um, you also, I think I heard something or read something, right? That you have something to do. Are you, are you in, in another, do you work in a film festival or something, Ryan? Um, no, I, so in Ogden, Utah, one of the historic, the, we have a historic theater here. It's called the Perry's Egyptian, um, theater and it's a, almost 100 years old. Wow. And, um, I'm on a board of directors called the, um, the, uh, Egyptian theater foundation. And our mission there is to, uh, and Brandy's on the board as well. Um, and so our mission there is to not only, uh, you know, do fundraising and try to collectively get money to help restore aspects of the theater as we go along, but also to bring a whole new generation of, of, um, people through the, through the movie theater who have either never been or, um, or also bringing people who had previously gone, in, in the years when they were, when they were younger, uh, cause through economic times and such, the Paris Egyptian theater had gone through, through this, through the sixties and seventies, just kind of, you know, went from being a premium theater to becoming a, a $3 theater or, um, or at the time what that equivalent would be, um, for the money at the time. And so it came down to where and then for a long time it was closed and it was ready to be demolished mm. in the late eighties. Um, and then, but through fundraising and money that was being developed, it eventually reopened in the late nineties. And so then our mission is just to keep it kind of up and alive. And so there's a whole, you know, when I was growing up, I, I, my, my parents told me stories of the Egyptian theater, but I'd never been in it inside of it because it was closed. Now it's reopened. So, so we work a lot with that. And through there, um, we've often, um, through our foundation, our, our, um, through our foundation, we've sponsored here locally, a film festival called the Ogden film festival and um and through that sponsorship i've been able to do q and a's or kind of just be a uh, part of that in various aspects so um did you did you um take drama classes and stuff like that in in school right uh i did yeah when i was um when i was in high school i i uh, took two years of drama um i actually found i was doing a lot more acting in debate i was part of the debate team when i was in when I was in high school and, and there's this, there's an aspect of the competition. It was called a dramatic duo where you would have, you could either do a monologue or you can have the two of you. Um, but you weren't allowed to look at each other. You had to look straight forward and then perform, uh, a piece that had two people. And so it would do that. And we were, and, um, when I was in high school I was, and I was winning, we were winning you know, trophies, second place, third place, things like that, different debate tournaments around. As I got to college though, I only focused on the film on the filmmaking aspect of things. I, 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 I kind of had put aside the idea of acting and was only focusing on being director. So I kind of just later developed, um, as these other, these other filmmaking friends of mine, uh, Matt Johnson, Jason White, uh, Madison easily were started throwing me in front of the camera that I kind of came back to it. Wow. That's, that's really cool. Um, are you going to, are you working on any other projects right now? So we have a, a few different things, um, kind of lined up and, um, I'll let Brandy speak to her own piece here in a moment. But one of the other things we look forward to doing, like I've mentioned, we have, we have a horror, a short horror film series called ancient evil. And what we really were looking forward to do this year, uh, we'll kind of see what we can, what is available for any of us to do at this point, um, uh, with COVID, but we're working on making ancient evil, the movie, um, uh, as far as uh, our, our horror films are are also kind of like with parts of Married and Loving It, it's very dramatic, but almost in a funny way, um, <laughs> or at least for my piece. Uh, so, so I actually re- recently just finished up writing my segment of it. We're going to do a, an anthology film where each of us take, you know, twenty or thirty minutes uh, to do our own horror horror film um, in that aspect. And then I have a few other things I'm writing on writing and working on another feature film and, uh, kind of make that decision. But also, you know, we've been productive during our quarantine. And so, um, we also have Brandy's film, um, that we finished as well. And you don't yeah. have to be productive just so you know, you can just kick <laughs> yeah. back and be lazy and take advantage of it. Just, just for all our listeners, you don't have to be productive. <laughs> <laughs> go yeah. ahead Brandy <laughs> yeah we, we try to not like take we try to take down days especially when we you know we don't always have all four of our daughters we have four young daughters under the age of nine so how do you um, do that four girls huh yeah <laughs> it's, it's a handful how do you um, how do you feel about that right <laughs> 
It's a handful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have four young daughters that we share with other, uh, two other uh, folks, two other parents. Um, so we don't always have them. So sometimes when we, when we don't have them, that's when we really try to be productive and be like, what can we work on? What's next? <laughs> but sometimes Ryan and I just go, let's just sit for a minute and let's just watch a movie and relax. And I think that's okay too. So definitely, definitely take advantage of downtime. Um, but yeah, when a creative moment sparks, I think it's important to, to jump on it um, when you can. Yeah. So, like this project that you're going to tell us about, right? Yes. Yeah, so I, um, I shot, um, I had an idea for a film, a short film, um, and we shot it last year. Um, I just had it, um, finished and wrapped up during this quarantine. Um, I had my editor, Lucas Hardy. Um, he was great. Um, he finished it up for me. So I've actually just been starting to submit to other festivals. So, um, it was also shot on a, an iPhone. Oh, uh, and it's just a micro short, short film. It's only, I think, three and a half minutes, barely well, that. So I think uh, it qualifies for the shorts category. <laughs> oh, <laughs> or well, great. I, yeah. I will plan on probably submitting to your guys' festivals. So, there you go. yeah, so that's that's what I finished. Um, but um, like I said, Ryan mentioned the Ancient Evil series. I'm I'm writing a piece of that, but I won't be directing it. Uh, so I'm just, I have a lot of little projects that we're always working on. And um, so that's what's going on. I think that's awesome that you guys are both working on the or on the same, you know, industry, right? Together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I got a feeling, Brandy, that you're gonna end up acting. Do you think so? You, <laughs> yeah, you I tell? think you're gonna end yeah. up acting in one of at least one of Ryan's films. <laughs> we shall see. You know, I was always interested in it when I was younger. Um, and I've always been around movies my entire life. My dad was in the industry in, in Los Angeles. He was a stuntman producer. Um, and he kind of exposed me to that as a child when he came out here. So I've always had an interest in film. Yeah. Um, but even the acting bug, but as I got older, I just, I kind of liked the idea of just screenwriting and producing. So, so yeah, we'll I like, I like, um, I took drama classes all through high school, but I moved around a lot. My father was in the military and um, it was the best way to get in when you went from middle school to high school to fit right in because you always go with the crazy people in the in the high school who are not shy. Right. Uh, <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I always took drama classes. But the idea of being recorded, you know, for me was not was not really good. Um, and I I've always enjoyed being behind a camera. I got my first camera when I was seven years old. Um mm-hmm. Uh, my father was a, a photographer and he also wrote and did art and he was a Marine and he was a scuba diver. He was like the James Bond, right? Yeah. Type. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so one of the things that I really got into, uh, with the camera when I was a little kid that I saw him do, he would go up light posts and things like that to get shots of things, um, was the whole perspective thing. And so when I found uh, video, um, that was my my main interest. I didn't know that you called it cinematography at the time, mm-hmm. um, you know, from that perspective and then putting things together to create an effect. Um, I had no idea. But my first camera was a big VHS Panasonic camera. <laughs> those are great. <laughs> yeah. It was definitely those. not an iPhone-sized camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's that lightweight, it's just a big monstrous thing you're holding on your shoulder. Yeah. I know. I used to like. I used to go and just shoot parades, you know, in town and things like that. And people would get out of their way, and <laughs> the the you know the town sheriff or whatever would wave at me like I was in in the news or something. I'm like, I'm just, I'm just like, no, really. <laughs> yeah, just play into it. Just be like, yeah, this people is get out business. of their way. Yeah, right. Yeah. They were just yeah. like thinking it was like a big beta cam. Uh, (laughs) camera at the time um what would you guys like to as we are time always flies you know when you get after the middle of of an episode when I have such a wonderful conversation with people like you guys um it starts to really get interesting and fun uh but I want to make sure that I didn't miss something uh is there something that you'd like to share that that we didn't get to talk about I don't know. I missed the beginning of the conversation. I apologize. I joined late. Um, Ryan, I guess you probably speak to that. Um, no, I think, you know, there's a, there's a moment where you asked me about certain shout outs and, 
And then as we were also speaking of uh, Brandy's film that she shot and a lot of people who worked on my film then worked on her film. But again, because we're also kind of a, a film family right. at this point as well. Mm -hmm. And so Matt Johnson, cinematographer, also shot that film. Um, Jason White, who is the producer on my film, is acting in Brandy's film. Mm -hmm. uh, Madison Easley, who... Um, who uh, did some of the final sound stuff for my movie? Also, uh, did all of our, our behind the scenes um, uh, photography and so a lot of our promo videos, things like that. Um, there's really no small part when it came to making the movie, even down to Lucas Hardy, who edited um, Brainy's film. He was the editor for our film for Married and Loving It, and um, and just carried the ball the entire way and. Um, as far as getting that film wrapped up. And so all the long hours that he obviously with editing takes forever. And so all the long hours that he put in there and, um, and so, yeah, we just had so many pe different people help us with the movie. And so when you're, when you look, when you see the film and you see the credits roll by and you see that, you know, there's maybe our names are mentioned more than once it's because that's, we were doing that job. That was, that was, the, you know, at, at different times what we were, uh, you know, c combating against when you only have eight people and, and everybody, um, whose name you see there really gave, um, you know, they gave up their time cause we shot this also on our weekends mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so they get their time away from, from family members, um, you know, from friends, from maybe even other outings that they maybe have, would have done and then, uh, and spent that time with us. And so, um, speaking of you know, weekends, how many, how long did it take during the production itself? I think overall, I think it was, we shot over the course of five weekends. And I think there was only one time we had to reschedule that. Um, we had some uh, internal family issues. So we've had, I think we only had to reschedule one of those shooting weekends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. we There was a total of uh, eight, eight, eight shooting days. Shooting days. Wow. Yeah. And these so are 12 hour days, of course. Well, no, on some of them some actually, of them finished on time. yeah. Um, <laughs> Surprisingly, we stuck yeah. to we stuck to the schedule and we finished on time on a lot of the days. Mm -hmm. I think one of the only times we really went over to hit that, that twelve hour mark was the day that we shot Ryan's piece. Um, some of the pieces with aesthetics, and you'll you'll see that in the film. Um, that took a lot of prep um, to oh, set yeah. up certain yeah. shots, and I think I think that was really the only longest day that I can that I can recall. Yeah, well, I had this thing. I mean, you we've been. I just, uh, we've been doing this enough times. I, I just wanted to be where I want to have fun still. And I hate it when we get to the end of our Saturday. Um, and you know, by the time we wrap it's eight, eight but by the time we actually all leave and go home, it's, you know, going on 10 o'clock and I want it to be where my goal was to be done by five. I was like, if I can be done shooting by five o'clock, that's, you know, we, we started at eight, we're done by five and we all go home and we still have time to spend with our family. Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, catch a movie if we want to, or just kind of, you know, unwind for that bit. And I didn't want it to be something that was a huge burden. So, uh, the very opening piece, which is, um, what look, appears to be a seamless one take shot, um, and with, uh, Mike Solaris and, uh, Nicole Finney, or that was, I think we were done by four on that day. Um, and, you know, they, they'd done all the rehearsal for, they memorized 17 pages of dialogue, and, um, you know, we did some blocking the night before, mm -hmm. then we met up the next day and we just went piece by piece and, um, and, sh and shot it. And, and we were wrapped on that day by four o'clock. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was pretty slick. And then there's some other days as, as every person who's, you know, um, you know, taken forth to make a, a film, you know, there's, there's, especially when you're running against time. So there are some moments where where I'm like, I'm like looking at the script where we're at and I'm like marking, like, this is what time of the day we need to be at this page as we go along. It's like, we got to be done. And so that we can be done. I told people five, we're going to, we got to wrap by five. And so that means, you know, figuring out how I can, instead of a shot reverse shot, now we're going to put them in uh, a two shot together and I'll have them stand like, I'll have them just move like this, which actually, as you said, becoming creative actually almost made it better because I was getting rid of some of the just shot reverse shot stuff and actually putting two actors on screen together and allowing them to just you know do their do their thing act you know and it was very um it was very dialogue heavy too mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean yeah the whole film is is talking faces <laughs> well <laughs> in a sense, I mean, you know yeah uh well I, I wanted to present a um a drama well 
drama, but I, I kind of mixed in. I couldn't help but putting in what I think is comedy, <laughs> or <laughs> or uh, or some of the other horror horror elements. But um, but uh, yeah, the, the other when I was coming when I was going to write it as well, I was you know thinking of make of the budget and making it the aesthetic. So that's why it's set in one location. That's why it's just the 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 two. Um, you know, the, the husband and the wife. And that's why there's not a police chase or a bus on fire or, you know, an alien spaceship coming from the sky. I, you know, we don't have any green screen in this entire movie. So, yeah, no you know, yeah. It was the aliens that I kept looking for throughout the whole movie. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> UFOs coming through the window. <laughs> Uh, um, let me ask you something really quick about the intensity of the dialogue. Did you guys have to, uh, do any retakes because of that? Was there improvisation or anything? Um, not too much. The, the only improv mm -hmm. part I, I said was when it came to using the F word, I was like, I don't care which variation of it you use, but I want it used. That was... Um, and so that was, so that was that there, there may have been a line or two here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty true to the, to the original way that we wrote the script or the way I, I wrote the script. I mean, and I, um, and I think we did that, sorry to interrupt you, Ryan. I think we did that also purposely to, for the sake of time and understanding that we have a schedule to keep to, we didn't want to deviate from, from the script yeah. too much. You had to have good actors though, um, for that. <laughs> were, were any of them, uh, stage actors or yeah all of them are are um are professional actors um some some have done stage work and also uh film acting um so that was the piece that was where like i said earlier you know mike was the one person who we knew before this going into it mike slares um and so we held a, ca a casting call and we had people come in and then we had we did second callbacks and then we even um we even went and had them where they came back and I was pinning them together because I wasn't sure who was going to work with which, you know, right. which, how, how was the couple was going to, what was the dynamic going to look like and how was it, how was it going to go from there? Um, and so that was the main thing. But as far as improv, yeah, it didn't really sway too much. If It might be a line or two, but it wasn't, there wasn't a moment of just kind of just say whatever or just gloves right. off or anything. It was all, um, it was all on the page. What would be your advice, one thing, one message that if you could, you know, let's just say right now you're at the film festival, we're all staring at you and you have uh, a message that you'd like to give to the filmmakers, something memorable that um, they, they should be aware of or they might want to be mindful of in, in terms of mobile filmmaking. Um, I think... I think um, make your aesthetic your budget. Um, work with what you have. Be creative. Work with people um, that you have some film experience with. Um, yeah, get a good crew behind you. I think I think that's really important. Yeah, I, um, I'd say this, whether you're not whether or not you're working with the phone or or just filmmaking in general. But my feeling is is just if you're going to make a film, just keep in mind there are no rules in filmmaking um you know we, we'll talk about things the 180 degree rule everything's just a guideline and um and if you come at if you come at making a movie with that aspect especially if you're going to make a movie with a phone and just reminding yourself that there are no rules in this it is it is your story to tell um it's your vision and whether it's on a phone or not it's still still you know it's your vision to show and i think sometimes I find the indie directors that I work with at my level, um, a lot of times, you know, it's like they're trying to make the next spy movie on a budget that doesn't fit, you know, what we have available. And you find, um, you might find a, a the short film. Sometimes it'd be some 22 year old kid and he's playing an FBI veteran. It just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense in that, in that level. Right. Somebody who's like three days away from retirement. Um, cause you know, cause you're making it with your buddies. But so I just say, you know, don't, just, don't try to make your Hollywood movie um, on a budget that you don't have. Be creative, and just remember, there's no rules. You can you can put the camera anywhere, you can cut any time, you can keep it as long as you want. You know, this is it's it's our jazz of our medium, um, 
and uh yeah i might have to quote you on that it's the jazz (laughs) of the medium there (laughs) yeah (laughs) all right guys um you ready to say goodbye to everybody Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, we hope you enjoy the film. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you as well uh, for having us. I'm glad we're, we're still able to, um, you know, make aspects of the festival, you know, um, work. And, and we're excited to show everyone the film. And um, I, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, the director of drive has a quote that says, if, you know, half the, half the audience loved it and half the audience hated it. And that was perfect cinema for him. <laughs> um, I hope that half the hot people don't hate it, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but either way, but we appreciate, you know, um, everybody taking a look and you know, let us know what you think. <laughs> <laughs>